an entire world is ready for you to start your career teaching the path to wellness. Mastering the science of mindfulness and the art of coaching to help clients achieve mental, emotional, and physical betterment of life through movement, nutrition, recovery, and regeneration. Because impacting one person impacts a family. Impacting a family impacts a community. And impacting a community impacts the world. Become an NASM Certified Wellness Coach. You are listening to the NASM CPT Podcast with Rick Ritchie, the official podcast of the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Hey, y'all, and welcome to the NASM CPT Podcast. My name is Rick Ritchie, and today we're back talking about functional anatomy, and I want to talk to you today about the quadriceps group, the quads. Let's talk about quads. First of all, let's talk about the name quadriceps. We talked about this when we discussed biceps. When we break this down in the etymology, quad means four, seps means head. So there are four heads of this one muscle. Now, why is it one muscle? Because they have a common tendon. So the quadriceps tendon that goes over the kneecap or the patella uh, is, is what they all actually kind of kind of converge into but they all have separate proximal attachments or sometimes referred to as origin. So origin and insertion and an origin would be the proximal attachment, which I like to utilize, or the insertion would be the distal attachment. So let's talk proximal attachment. Well, before we do that, we got to break it down. There are four muscles. Let's talk about what they are. All four muscles cross over the knee. And then three of them stay on the front or sides of the thigh. And then a fourth one crosses over the hip. There are the vastus family, right? So the vastus, there's vastus lateralis, which is the large lateral muscle on of the quadricep. There's the vastus medialis, which some of you know vastus medialis because of a particular portion of the vastus medialis called the vastus medialis obliquus, or the VMO, which is referred to as how we refer to it a lot of times. And that's a little teardrop section of the quadriceps on the medial side or the inside of the thigh. And then there's the vastus intermedius. So intermedius means it's between two things. So it's between the lateralis and the medialis, the vastus intermedius. Now these all start at the kind of the the top of the femur. But interestingly, things like the the medialis and lateralis actually wrap around the bone of the femur and they attach to something called the linea aspira of the femur, which is on the posterior side of the femur. So it's weird that we actually think about this, that our quadriceps can attach to the posterior side of the leg, but the meat of them are either medial, lateral, or anterior on the leg. So vastus, lateralis, medialis, and intermedius are the three that have its proximal attachment on the femur. But then there, the vastus family, we got all four of them. Oh, sorry, all three of them. And then somebody comes in from the outside and wrecks the family. There's an outsider that comes in and wrecks it. And that would be the rectus femoris or rectus femoris. And it comes in from the outside because it actually comes in from above the hip, across the hip. So it crosses the hip joint and then it joins forces with the vastus family and goes into the patellar tendon and crosses over the knee joint. Now, with that said, steal yourself. I'm going to tell you a story. And I'll tell you this story because it was a story that was told to me when I was teaching this workshop. I was working for a company and teaching exercise science at a place in Boston. And so I was in Boston, I'm teaching anatomy, and somebody raised their hand as I'm talking about this. Now, let me give you a little bit more information. I'm going to tell you a story where listener discretion is advised, not because I'm telling you a, a vulgar story, but it's about an injury. So 
Let's go from the origin, from the AIIS of the rectus femoris. So the AIIS is the anterior inferior iliac spine. You may hear the ASIS on a regular basis as referred to as a bony landmark on the pelvis. So the anterior superior iliac spine, but below that is the anterior inferior iliac spine. And that is where the rectus femoris attaches to its proximal attachment. And then it goes down the leg. It joins forces with the vastus family. And then here's the interesting part. It goes over the top of the kneecap. Think about that for a moment. In fact, just take a moment. And if you're seated, feel your kneecap. Just feel the patella. It feels like there is skin and then patella, but there is a really incredibly strong fibrous tendon and the patella is underneath it. And that fibrous tendon goes over the top. The patella is actually something called a sesamoid bone. And that is a bone that grows inside of a tendon, but there's no tendon on the bottom. The tendon only goes over the top of it. The purpose of the patella, to what we know and what we believe is the case, it's, it actually helps create a leverage point for the, the knee extension. So when we straighten our knee out, so our quads straighten our knee, they do knee extension. So the patella is considered to be kind of like uh, if, you, if you ever see cranes. And I, I live in New York City. There are cranes oftentimes in the skyline that we see on a regular basis. And at the top of the crane where the cable kind of goes from the top of the metal and then drops down so it can pick something up, there's this, there's this extra area that, that looks like it just goes over and rounds out the cable so it doesn't just drop straight down. That gives it leverage. Well, your patella kind of extends the and rounds out the top of the femur so it gets reach around to the tibia the the leg bone that it crosses over the knee and attaches to so if you go over the patella and then you follow down to the front of the tibia there's a bump there there's a bump there just below the patella just below like where, it's just where the knee uh, ends and the tibia begins and it sticks out. That's called the tibial tuberosity. That's where the quadriceps attach into. Well, if you think about it, this is incredibly thin. It's incredibly thin. It does a lot of work. This tendon's incredibly thin, attaches to very large muscles around two very, very long levers, the tibia and the femur. And so it has a lot of tension there. All right. Now here comes the story. The story is the person raises their hand after I talk about where the tibial tuberosity is and I talk about the vulnerability of the patella, you know, and the quadriceps tendon going over the top of the patella, attaching into the tibia, and they raise their hand. And they said, um, can I tell you a gross story? And me as the teacher kind of weighing the, I, I would, yes, absolutely. Tell me a gross story. I want to hear. And they said that they were uh, running or jumping uh, stadium stairs. And as they were running or as they were jumping, whatever it was, their toe caught on the stadium stair and their knee went directly into the stair in front of them. And it severed the patellar tendon below the patella. And they were like, uh, it was like a Venetian blind. It just detached the patella and the rest of the quads jump up to the top of the thigh. I know it's so gross. It's so gross. But it clarifies so much for me. And I, of course, at that moment, everybody is staring. And they are in awe and shock. And I said, well, when it happened, what did you do? And they said, I fainted. And I was like, that sounds like exactly what I would do if it happened to me or if I watched it happen to somebody else. I would not be able to call 911 because I would be lying down next to you, uh, fainted. So what happened? They take something, they bring it, and they attach the patellar tendon 
back to the vestibular tuberosity. Now, the quadricep tendon is considered to be the tendon above the patella and the patellar tendon from the patella to the tibia. They're all, it's the same thing. It's all the same unit, but sometimes they are names that differentiate each other. So the patellar tendon was severed and the quadriceps shortened. All right, well, let's talk about, now, now that that's over, now that many of you have decided not to follow me through the rest of this, uh, let's go through the rest of this. There are two joints that the quadriceps cross. Now, as a family, the rectus femoris is a two-joint muscle. Uh, it crosses over the hip, and they all cross over the knee. But when you think about stretching your quads, what do you do? Well, you don't just bend your knee but we extend the hip. And the truth of the matter is, if you just sat in a seated position and you pulled your knee to your backside and you don't feel a stretch, that's because usually the one joint muscles like the vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, vastus intermedius, the one joint muscle only crossing a single joint, they don't actually get as tight generally as two joint muscles. So when you bend your knee to your backside and then extend your hip and you feel the stretch in your quads, that's really mostly a rectus femoris stretch. It's a rectus femoris stretch because we are flexing the knee and we are extending the hip. Well, what does it do concentrically? Well, concentrically, we know from leg extension exercises that the quadricep extends the knee. We also know that the rectus femoris, because it crosses the hip on the anterior side, what joint action will it do? If it crosses the hip on the anterior or front side, what's the joint action? Yeah, flexion. So hip flexion. In fact, if you are standing, go and bend your knee 90 degrees, go into hip flexion of 90 degrees, keep the hip flexed, and now extend your knee and you will feel the rectus femoris really get tight, even crampy, you might even go into a little Charlie horse mode. And then how do you stretch it? You extend your hip back behind you, you pull your heel towards your butt, and you get your quad stretch. So that's how we will do uh, stretching exercises for the rectus femoris. And because it pulls on the tendon, then it can just stretch some of the other uh, quadriceps as well. Now. What are some of the things that we look at here What, when it comes to our quads? One is the tendency that many of us have for exercises like um, uh, squats to shift our weight forward and to the balls of our feet so our heels come off. Often our heels come up and they turn in, which gives us a toe out positioning. And that happens for a couple of reasons. One, because just mechanics of a squat that you may not know how to squat, and that's just you shift forward. Two is you might have really tight calves, so the heels come up and turn in. But the other part is the tendency for people to work their quads, the anterior chain when they do squats, versus add a little more posterior chain. And so when you lean forward, you shift your weight over onto the balls of the feet, then it becomes a bit more, that squat becomes a bit more quadricep dominant. And that happens a lot for people who have a hard time engaging the posterior chain, the glutes in particular. So yeah, squats will work, glutes and hamstrings and quads and calves. But as we shift forward into the ball of the foot, when we go into the squat, then it becomes more anterior chain dominant. So that's probably something to think about. And in some instances, it may be okay, especially if you're trying to go for a quad dominant exercise. They also have some things called um, the Nordic curls for your hamstrings or the reverse Nordic. These are some body weight exercises that can be challenging for people who have knee issues but that's just if you go into a two, uh, two knee kneeling position. So you're just on both knees and then you lean backwards into to knee flexion and then extend up. Now, when you come up into knee extension, you're only coming into a 90 degree knee extension because you're doing this exercise on your knees. But it's amazing with some people have the capability of keeping a neutral position from their head, shoulders, hips, which is the hard part to stay neutral here, uh, down to their knees, and then they just 
go into knee flexion as they lean back and they extend themselves up. One of the other things to pay attention to is that the patella along the femur, so if you look at your femur, you feel your femur right at the very bottom where the knee is, there's like a, a divot or in anatomy world, it's called a sulcus. So there's a little divot and the, the patella is rounded on the top, but it's got a rounded shape fin sort of on the bottom. And that shape goes right there in between the sulcus. It allows it to, to slide superior and inferior along that those two notches within those two notches at the femur. But sometimes we have something called a patellar tracking issue. And the tendency is that the patella starts to track laterally uh, and it can lead to some knee pain. So one of the muscles and the reason why I mentioned you may know the VMO or the vastus medialis obliquus is because the VMO and you know, usually like the last 10 degrees of knee extension really starts to activate more. And because it has an oblique pull, it doesn't just pull superior, but it pulls medially as well, then it can realign the tracking of the patella. So especially that kind of 30 to zero degrees, but the last 10 degrees of knee extension, the VMO has a particular advantage and it pulls the medially the patella. So things like TKEs, terminal knee extensions are good exercises. Now these are not one rep max. They're actually, you wanna do probably a little bit higher repetition because we want the BMO to rehearse pulling that. And so we're not just strengthening a muscle, we're also training neurologically a muscle to activate during this so that the tracking of the patella, that lateral tracking starts to neutralize and the patella stays within that patellar groove. And that way you can protect your knees by isolating, not isolating, it doesn't really work that way, but by preferentially activating the BMO. Now, people ask a lot of times, can I work the lateral more than the medial or the intermedius? The, the answer is not really because the knee is a hinge joint, so it works a certain way. It's just that the VMO, when you get to the last few degrees of knee extension, because of that corkscrew mechanism in the knee, it will pull medially and activate a little bit more. Rectus femoris, you can activate that one more individually or preferentially individually by doing hip flexion exercises along with your knee extensions because it crosses two joints. All right. Well, I hope that you found that at least a little bit helpful. The quadriceps, vastus lateralis, intermedius, medialis, and then someone comes in from the outside and wrecks the family. It's the rectus femoris. Rectus, I like this one, etymology. It means straight line. So the rectus femoris goes up and down in a straight line. Your rectus abdominis goes up and down in a straight line. So that's where we get that from. If you have questions about today or uh, you have requests, recommendations, something that you'd like for me to cover, an interview you'd like me to have, please reach out to me. You can do that on Instagram, uh, most mostly there at dr.rickritchie, or you can email me at rick.ritchie, R-I-C-H-E-Y, at nasm.org. Thank you so much for the fitness family listening to this. Like, share, subscribe, and tell your fitness friends about it. This has been the NASM CPT Podcast.